Right. Hi again, everyone. We are also now live streaming uh, for all of our audience on uh, YouTube live on our website. So thanks for joining early and we will come in soon. Right, I think it's sharp for 2.30 Indian time and uh, uh, it's a good time to begin. So let me bus just start by saying hello, uh, morning, afternoon, uh, everyone is joining from different parts of the world. Thank you for joining for this IMRC 2022 second session, which is on technological advancements and shipbuilding. Uh, I would just like to introduce the moderator and then I will leave it to his capable hands to carry forward this discussion. Uh, so our moderator for today is Captain Kishore, uh, an extra master. After, after stepping ashore in 1990, he was in the maritime time uh, ship management sector till 2004 and he then changed track to software solutions based in Singapore subsequently relocated back to Mumbai to head Kongsberg oil and gas a wholly owned subsidiary of Kongsberg Group and a Nor Norwegian PSU majorly into defense aerospace maritime uh, oil and gas uh, deep drilling uh, uh, sectors uh, and he retired in 2018 as the managing director India of Kongsberg Digital uh, which the business entity provided embedded software solutions uh, and he's presently an independent consultant and director with companies uh, 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 into maritime, renewable energy, and digital platforms, etc. And with him, we also have Mr. Ulas Kalgadki, who is part of our committee, who will be uh, the assimilator for this session. And he served as a senior vice president and chief surveyor at Indian Register of Shipping prior to retiring in 2015 and then continuing in as, a, as a technical advisor uh, at IRS Mumbai. And he's enriched with background of sealing experience and has presented over 20 various technical papers on various subjects. Um, and he has been a faculty and guest speaker at many noted maritime uh, training establishments. His papers include uh, different various subjects covering welding, shipbuilding, greenhouse gas emission, uh, ship recycling, uh, energy efficiency design index, etc. So uh, with that, Captain Kishore, over to you uh, for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Yogata. Thank you, IMRC, for inviting us. Uh, last, I think we started the session yesterday. Those of you who attended the inaugural session, we had some really good views uh, coming in from all the speakers there. Then this morning, actually propelled the, the train of IMRC forward for this year. Um, Actually, we had very, very good discussion uh, from various very senior panelists. And one of the things that uh, did come up very, very clearly is the challenges that faces our industry, the maritime industry. Not something new. We've been hearing about this uh, for, as uh, my good friend Ulas will say, for donkey's years. But for years, we've been hearing about this. But positively, the movement um, towards finding a solution to all these challenges uh, is very much in sight for us. How and when is how possibly IMRC is trying to uncover in each of the sessions. So this session is, is, is a small subset coming out of the morning session where we identified the challenges across the industry. And here we will concentrate on the shipbuilding, shipyard, ship repairs, and that related sectors. Uh, Sometimes you really wonder in the morning, uh, um, one, one, uh, two of the panelists actually stated that India is the top three countries in steel manufacturing. India is far ahead in so many other things. Uh, but when it comes to shipbuilding and shipyards, we are as sleepy as an afternoon session and we have to make it as lively as this afternoon session. So that's, that's possibly is the, uh, is the way forward for us. And um, why is a question that I think our uh, esteemed panelists will be able to answer. 
But one of the things that always foxes me, on one side, yes, we keep saying that the Indian shipbuilding um, and shipyard sector is uh, almost negligent in the world uh, scenario. Uh, whereas on the other side, uh, I just realized, I just got to know that uh, the fully autonomous vessels order from a large Norwegian logistic group has two of them are on order in Cochin and the other four in Chowgli shipyard. It really beats me. And that's where possibly the answer to the solution comes from some of the esteemed uh, panelists. And maybe the answer is uh, right in front of us. It is for us to grab it and move it, for, uh, move it forward. So with this in question, um, friends, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelist, a very, very learned uh, member of uh, our fraternity. Um, so we, I will start with Mr. Shujai Shiel. He is the COO of Hunter Group. As he says, he's a very senior marine engineer who, as he says, he's a hammer and spanner man who finds a solution to everything. So he is one man who's managed to find a solution to any engineering challenges that, I will not use the word problems, because with challenges, you always find solutions. So he has managed to find a solution to almost all challenges and logically prove a point even to the, uh, uh, towards making sure that the rules and regulations are clearly and um, uh, not circumvented in any way, keeping up to the quality of solution to the highest quality. And he is, of course, Hunter Group is where, the, as you say, the money bags of the industry. They're the guys who actually, uh, he, he's built uh, so many uh, VLCCs. Uh, he, build, he builds it uh, right from design to the delivery stage and then sells it and makes money. Wow, fantastic job. So that is the, his background that he comes from. He is based out of Oslo in Norway. So from that cold, um, really cold area, but a beautiful country, he's going to warm our session today uh, in the first part of the session. Joining him is another marine engineer, Syed Abdi. He is like our Kapil Dev against Zimbabwe. He is a restructuring expert from a 17 for, for five to win the match and then further on to the World Cup. And that's our Syed. He is a man who restructures, um, re, uh, manages to restructures uh, ailing shipyards to make sure that they also are there in the play and doing well. So we have Syed with us. Welcome, Syed. And joining the two mariners is um, Mr. Aditya Chandavarkar. He is our actual expert on what we possibly identify as a possible solution towards many of the challenges that faces our industry. Uh, a possible solution could be what is commonly known as additive manufacturing or 3D printing area. So he's, he, he will be giving us a lot of insight into this aspect of it and how it can reflect itself into the maritime world. And joining him is another true son of the Indian soil, Dr. Shastri, a person whom we all could be proud of. You know, it reminds me of the time when Dr. C.V. Raman identified the great Dr. Homi Baba and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. And Dr. Vikram Sarabhai identified another great man, Dr. Abdul Kalam. And actually, Dr. Shastri was identified as a great brain by Abdul Kalam himself. Dr. Abdul Kalam himself picked up from IIT Chennai, uh, taken up to join CASR in Bhopal and further loaned to the Belgian government where he continued his research on materials and then grabbed by DNV. So he is based in uh, very close to um, Suja in Hovik in DNV and uh, he is heading this entire department of DNV. Uh, all their personal profiles is already available to you on the social media so you can read through and this is our um, esteemed panelist for today. So I will start the session by possibly uh, asking a very simple question to Sujai. Uh, Sujai, with the present situation, how do you uh, foresee the current situation in shipbuilding repairs? And do you envisage this changing for the better, especially given the fact that in the morning session, we saw so much of challenges being discussed and solution being sought? Sujai. Kishore, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, but I'm humbled by your description. But to be honest, uh, the rest of it, following the hammer and spanner could be an exaggeration of my abilities. The hammer and spanner part, yes, that's where I am from. Now, coming to the issue of shipbuilding industry in India, 
Yes, uh, India has got six new build uh, orders for autonomous vessels for the ASCO project. That's a very creditable achievement on behalf of both the shipyards, Cochin, as well as, uh, as, well as Chogli. But at the crux of the problem, why shipbuilding industry has not grown over a period of time? Now, if you look at uh, historically, Hyundai and Cochin Shipyard was started approximately the same time in 1971 or 72. Hyundai builds 70 ships a year plus, actually. And where is Cochin Shipyard there? And at the root of all this problem, at least, at least I would look at it, is the lack of political will and government recognition as shipbuilding industry, as a strategic industry, as an infrastructure industry. I think that is where the main problem lies. Of course, there are other issues. You've got debt issue and debt issues and refinancing. You've got refund guarantee financing issues from banks. You've got project delays. You've got uh, infrastructure and customs and those controls in place in India. So in a nutshell, I think we need to have the government and political will to go forward. Thank you, Sujay. Sayed is much more involved with shipbuilding in India. Of course, he can elaborate and we can discuss on this further. But yes. I think I will also ask Sayed to come in and give some inputs. Yes, Sujay. Thank you. So, Sayed, actually, the ball is very much on your court. Uh, yes, I agree to the quality and cost of capital that comes out of India towards the sector. And we ourselves have seen two major private players who uh, tumbled up uh, a few years back and they went into NCLT and bankruptcy and so on and so forth. You are well aware of that. Despite that, do we have a solution, Syed? Yeah, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank IMRC for giving me this platform to share my views. Uh, because I have spent most of my time, uh, more than sailing, I have spent in shipyards across uh, Middle East and Far East, and in, also in India. And thank you, Captain Kushore, for the introduction. And uh, so I'll just move on straight to the topic. And as we are aware, most of the major private sector shipyards in India are currently financially stressed. Now, what are the reasons? One of the major reasons for this has been the not so robust fiscal discipline, stressed cash flows. Of course, this was compounded, greatly compounded by the major downturn in the industry from 2008 onwards for quite a few years. Now, what has that led to? This has led to these shipyards being referred to NCLT, the National Company Law Tribunal, by the COC, which is the Committee of Creditors, which is basically the Committee of the Lender Banks under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016 in India. The major objective of the IBC is to optimize the loan recovery for the lender banks. And one way is, of course, to find investors to execute a financial restructuring and most importantly, execute operational turnaround because you can financially sort of restructure, you can ease off the loan repayments, but as long as the system, the business sustainability is not there, uh, it will not work out. So the major here objective is to uh, execute a financial restructuring and an operational turnaround for business sustainability. Uh, during the last couple of years, of course, COVID has further adversely affected the industry in way of supply chain and logistics. And we'll focus here more on the topic of AM, which I feel looking forward is a great thing. It, uh, it is uh, like uh, we discussed, it is, uh, the more I get into it, I find that this has a lot of solutions in the shipbuilding, ship repair, ship conversion industry. So this has uh, greatly affected the smooth flow of equipment spares required for shipbuilding, conversion and repairs. So these are the basically the uh, sort of current status. Uh, 
and we'll come on to the solutions and areas at a later stage during this panel discussion. Yes, thank you, Sayed. I'm sorry, I had to unmute. Um, and then suddenly, the, when you want it, the, the arrow moves away from the laptop, you know, and then you have to get it back. So that is what, why it took time. But thank you very much, Sayed. Uh, I uh, really understand. And uh, um, um, when you said about COVID hitting the supply chain uh, across this industry, we all know, we keep reading about the chip uh, lackage or lackage of chip in the motor industry. And that is why the motor cars are getting not getting uh, delivered so easily. So I can imagine how much it can affect the um, chip building industry as such. So having said that, do you think one of the solution, as you said, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, do you think one of the solution could be using this technology to identify at least the components, spare parts to be done here and avoid this problem of supply chain? What do you think, Sayed? Yeah, definitely. The more uh, uh, I've been interacting with this particular uh, aspect. Uh, but before I go into the uh, additive manufacturing, I'd just like to go a bit deeper into the NPAs and financial stress to really come to the crux of uh, additive manufacturing. Just to understand that the loan which has become an NPA, a certain portion of it, in some cases, substantial portion of it is devolved bank guarantees which is given by banks to the clients and uh, the buyers from the shipyard against various stage milestone payments, for example, advance payment on placing new building order, key laying, hull completion, launching, delivery. Now, if the delivery is delayed beyond a certain time period, the client may cancel the contract and the advances paid by the client are returned to the client stroke buyer by the bank, which is basically becomes devolved bank guarantees and becomes a portion of the loan. Now, one of the reasons for the delays in vessel deliveries can be logistics. And in certain cases, it is substantial uh, logistics and supply chains. And not only uh, uh, late deliveries, but also costs. I've seen people ordering just because they are not sure of a robust supply chain. They order uh, things by flight, and then it is lying in the warehouse for six months. So logistics and supply chain becomes because a lot of equipment are coming from US, Europe, Japan, uh, and such places. And also, sometimes when the equipment or the materials come here, they may get damaged or even they get lost. Now, one of the solutions for this, and the more I get into it, I really appreciate the work done by uh, our esteemed Mr. Shastri. And uh, I've spoken to quite a few people who have a high esteem for him by working onto this uh, uh, AM. Similarly, for ship repair owners, they may not carry on board all the spares. When I was in Dubai Dry Docks, I noticed, for example, a pump is opened up, the impeller and the wearing have gone, but they don't have the spares there. For example, fortunately, Dubai has a good uh, sort of ancillary support, but other shipyards, for example, in Qatar and Oman, they do not have so much of uh, ancillary support. Here, uh, I've seen some impellers which have been uh, done by AIM and they are obviously as good as uh, the original. So these shipyards can utilize and the ship owners can utilize these spare parts. And for example, in Dubai, we used to give it to a foundry. It takes a lot of time. And uh, in Dubai, in fact, for VLCC, we used to turn around in six days. So time is of essence because any delay has a lot of uh, penalty clauses and also further uh, even to the extent the uh, charter may get cancelled. So the AM here is very, very effective and it really works as a silver bullet in some cases. I would go to that extent for making all these parts. Similarly, for shipyards, uh, I've visited most of the shipyards here which are under stress and one of the things they had done to reduce their costs, they got a lot of equipment like cranes, SPMTs and such things from shipyards in Europe which were uh, becoming under financial stress. Now, most of these equipment, the parts are obsolete. They have a long lead time and to uh, sort of get them back into operation, they require the spare parts. So that's again where AM can uh, really help in uh, doing the spare parts. Thanks, Sayed. Having said that, Suja, my question to you is, uh, we know as a country that we have the required skills. Our naval arcs, uh, naval arcs are one of the best in the world and uh, that's a known fact. 
our own people like anthony friends for example is the one who has turned around korean shipyards and Jap uh, japanese shipyards chinese shipyards you yourself have done so much abid has abdi has done so much sayil has done so much if uh, that is the case would you seriously consider as an over owner to give order to an indian shipyard for your vlcc for example or even smaller vessels i don't think india today for the vlcc is if you look at a uh, vlcc structure i don't think india builds those large marine engines we have to import it from i think vietnam or some china or korea if i'm not mistaken yes so it's it's a very difficult decision to say whether i'll go to india tomorrow if there's a project i mean it's very difficult because of the fundamental facts that we have in front of us with respect to the infrastructure with respect to say a small example is if you want to say a ship in operation let's bring in operations here and if i've seen challenges with sending spare parts to india the roadblock with customs etc with spare parts not arriving on time especially in the tanker industry where time is money and we can't have them delayed at airports due to some whims of a bureaucratic control we can't have it so there are challenges within the industry for say for us to take an order to india i mean i would say it's a big challenge i would say okay thanks sujay vessel. thanks sujay but on the other hand just combining the two uh, points that we discussed just now that of sayed saying that possibly am is a good solution which possibly does away with the custom formalities and staying uh, in a place uh, clearing it the supply chain part of it which we will of course understand better from uh, aditya and dr shastri uh, but if having said that uh, do you think that this could be one of the solutions that we are looking at because problems we all are aware of and as ulaz has always say we been aware of it for really a long time and solutions we are finding but surely we have the ability and the brains to find some solution including this so do you think this supply chain problem especially this last mile of getting stuck in the customs can be circumvented thanks to additive manufacturing what do you think sujay additive manufacturing cannot be a silver bullet to ship building it can be a silver bullet to certain components in operation means if somebody would give me a propeller by additive manufacturing on a vlcc i don't think i will put my name as being the guinea pig for that process i don't think so <laughs> let's be honest about it means we all technical people and i would not like to have a propeller on a vlcc made of additive manufacturing and being the first to install it no so let us so, uh, sorry so jai go ahead so look at small components of machinery yes but again in the tanker industry you need to do a risk mitigation process with the oil majors to use critical components if you are going to use am as a process it's not that easy as one thinks that you use am and use it number one number two is the solas and marpol regulations or the various regulatory bodies globally we have a roadblock there as well to using am for every component you got the nox code the sox code so you just we just can't look at am as the silver bullet to every single challenge that comes across in the maritime industry a part of it yes not as an integral solution thank you sujay having said that uh, let me go to aditya chandavarkar uh, especially to ask about what is this new animal am it seems to be a solution which on one side whereas it seems to be not a practical solution on the other side so where is it that we can meet these two standards together uh, especially with respect to regulations too so aditya yeah thanks thanks uh, captain kishore for uh, you know a nice introduction and great to be part of uh, this panel here with experts like sujoy sayed and of course uh, dr kandapuri as well and uh, you know so uh, i would agree uh in part with what uh, sujay and sayed have said about uh you know how additive manufacturing can kind of be a solution for certain situations so i'll just take one step back and uh you know for people who would uh, not be aware so additive manufacturing is a group of technologies uh where you are having a digital file 
which is converted into your component additively. So that's why the name additive manufacturing. So the, the part is manufactured additively compared to subtractively uh, in your conventional manufacturing processes. So with that, you know, that just sets the base for the technology. Um, and of course, uh, you know, going ahead from what Sujay mentioned about the reliability of, of this technology. So for example, in additive manufacturing, healthcare and aerospace have been at the forefront uh, of adopting this technology. Of course, each industry has its own dynamics, but just to give you a few examples on the reliability. So uh, there is a GE Leap engine uh, where, again, it's a small component, not a large propeller for a VLCC, but just to have a, so the, the nozzle for this uh, Leap engine is 3D printed. And, uh, you know, we've already, I think by last, last year, they've already crossed close to a lakh of these nozzles, which are printed, which are actually fitted into a leap engine. And I think they all already covered about 10 million uh, flying miles since last year. So these are being fitted onto an uh, actual leap engine, which goes into a GE airplane, uh, a GE engine. So there is a certain uh, factor where there's a test happened and this industry has kind of adopted this or this has been kind of a success case which then has been replicated at certain sections. So this is one example here. Of course, on the healthcare side, there have been uh, where there are implants which are made today with 3D printing which are implanted for certain surgeries, let's say orthopedic or uh, other aspects. Again, uh, I'm not trying to have a direct relation with this to shipbuilding, but these are you know some se sectors where there is reliability or or a process or a validation needed, uh, where it is possible to have uh, you know con considerably risky processes as well, where 3D printing fits in. Of course, uh, impellers are, are, are a, a very good example in the uh, maritime space where these can be made with 3D printing. Of course, depending on the size component, because 3D printing, if you look at it uh, today, uh, there are various technologies, but if you look at the laser powder bed fusion, which is for metal applications, uh, there is a limit for the, the size of part which can be made to it with th that technology. You know, uh, in, in the majority ones could be around 400 mm by 400 mm. But if, you, if you're going ahead, there are technologies that are coming which can print a meter uh, part, uh, square parts as well. And there are new technologies coming which can do larger uh, which is called uh, large surface additive manufacturing, where of course, in, not in metal, but in polymer, but few universities have printed the entire, uh, some of the boat uh, structures, which have kind of done some tests onto. Uh, so these are, again, some of them are research stage. Some of them are implemented like aerospace and healthcare. So there is a, su a successful case for considering this technology for some of the applications, you know, again, uh, some of the challenges which were mentioned earlier, some are more bureaucratic or some are more strategic in terms of, uh, you know, how a shipyard is, is, is run. Of course, AM can't do anything there, but uh, if we are looking at, uh, you know, digitizing an inventory so that the spare parts are available easily at in certain regions, wherever the ship is, or, or is uh, wherever the port of call is, this is one opportunity. Uh, and and similar, you know. So uh, that's my initial thoughts on this. Now, of course, uh, Dr. Shastri, please feel free to add uh, on these uh, areas. But this just just wanted to try to give a more you know uh, background to this uh, technology and some applications. Thanks, Aditya. Before we go to Dr. Shastri, just uh, one question. As you rightly said, it's not subtractive, so it is additive. So that means this also helps in reducing material loss and the components being correctly machined, if I may say so. Uh, is that true to that extent? Yes, so here uh, you are using the only, the amount of material you need. Uh, you are not really machining it out of uh, a block of metal and then cutting it to, so one is material and then the second is complexity of the design. Of course, light weighting is not such a big concern in marine, but let's say in aerospace, light weighting uh, and making the design more, uh, you know, which allows that better fuel efficiency is, an, is a factor, but uh, it allows more flexibility in the design of the component. And yes, it reduces the uh, material usage as well. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, going to Dr. Shastri, of course, who also is very much in the maritime sector being in DNV. So he would be able to combine the thoughts of the maritime and the AM uh, um, sector into what is uh, workable 
in the maritime sector and answering Sujoy's question about the regulatory aspect of that. Dr. Shastri. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Captain Kishore and other panelists. Um, it's my pleasure to, to share <clears throat> my, my firsthand opinions and experience here. So yeah, maybe before going to the additive manufacturing and maritime, maybe I, I tell my background, how close I have been looking at these two fields. Uh, so around 2000, uh, I, I went to Belgium and I was uh, you know, working with the Belgian research and there we, <clears throat> we started working with the 3D printing. And um, coincidentally later after two, three years, I did my PhD also in this area, but that time, um, automobile sector was was the driving force uh, for this technology. But you need some kind of a valid customer need and a convincing business case. For example, um, KTM motorcycles came to us and said that, you know, in a moving engine, um, if we can reduce a, one gram of, a, you know, a part, uh, for example, like a connecting dot, it can increase certain RPM. And uh, same with the, with the Ferrari, all those, uh, you know, so we were we were developing this technology in general. Uh, it was in the in the technology development. So later I moved to Canada and um, I was working with again still automobile uh, was still very interested. So I joined DNV 15 years ago, and I have been you know not doing additive manufacturing until six years ago. So almost from you know seven to eight years I was just following with my own background and. I have a strong background and worked with manufacturing in, um, you know, forgings, foundry, and all sorts of manufacturing, and of course combining. And I've been visiting the most important shipyards around the world, and also um, more biggest manufacturers in the world because I've been uh, leading the manufacturer approvals. So 2015, suddenly a lot of people contact started contacting both from maritime and. Uh, end users and also the manufacturing industry asking, hey, we see additive manufacturing as a potential. How can we use this? Uh, so then I, I immediately can connect a lot of cases. I, I, I still remember a case. I don't know if I should tell the, the shipyard name in India because I have been answering thousands of help desk questions that could be coming from either uh, shipbuilding our repairs or operations. For example, somebody says my shaft is broken. I have to sail within three hours. What to do? I have a shaft lying somewhere, you know, some material I don't know. Can I machine it and implement and, you know, uh, install? I also seen, uh, you know, even billion dollars at stake uh, where, for example, in one of the Korean shipyards um, uh, that was um, making container ships and you know, we have approved one one maker in in some country to to supply ca container corner castings, you know, small fittings, and the whole ship was almost finished, completed, say, you know, most of the formalities, and was about to leave. But they found a lot of those were delayed cracking somehow, and and this this has actually created a huge tension because to get you know now we have to change the manufacturer, get all this castings, maybe 200 of them to be replaced. Now, uh, also, I, I recall one case uh, from, from one of the shipyards in India. They, they have um, a last, they, they finally found that they have a shaft of one meter pipe somewhere. It should be coming from a class approved place, uh, manufacturer. And who will sell you a meter pipe? You have, to, you have to buy bundles. So when I connect all these cases and I see, yes, I jumped in 2015, and I, I started visiting a lot of uh, those people who have uh, actually asked us, um, you know, can add it to manufacturing. So we started writing rules, looking at their, their cases, and we have seen numerous, now thousands of cases have been used. Now, coming to the back uh, again, to the base point, this is, a, this is not a push technology. It is not something you push and you can, if you have it, you forget and you, your ship will be automatically built. We are not saying that. It is a pull technology, meaning if you have some problem, if you think that, yeah, I wish I wish I had a, um, to produce my container castings and you know I could have just printed in 10 machines in 20 minutes or you know, half an hour, within a day I could have pushed out my container ship rather than waiting it. 
I could have actually, you know, um, pushed, uh, printed that one meter pipe uh, in, in one or two days and, and got rid of my ship, you know, that, so, so, so these are a um, lot of possibilities. So additive manufacturing uh, can provide a lot of solutions. But again, now we have to look into the time scale. Past, okay, it was not there, no problem. But present, can it solve every problem? It cannot solve because as I said, this is a tool and it should be, this tool should be um, customized for your needs. So this is what we are doing from DNV, and especially for last five years, I'm full-time working. I've been in Singapore, invited by Singapore um, government uh, initiatives. I stayed four years heading our center of excellence on additive manufacturing, working full-time with most of the shipyards around the world and, and many other uh, oil and gas, et cetera. So now we see um, it's, it's, it's really can, you know, if somebody wants to, uh, Sujay has actually mentioned something very interesting that engines, you know, and, and also Captain Kishore, you mentioned about engine, um, you know, India to develop. So you need engine, you know, Korea have so many ancillary companies that supports, you know, engine making. So, so India, uh, uh, if, if they want to become a manufacturing hub for the future engines, they should have additive manufacturing capabilities. They should have all other, but it will add. So my point is that now uh, maybe I'll give a pause and come back. Additive manufacturing will really help um, to solve many issues. So maybe I, I finish with uh, three things, um, three points. One is a part to part replacement. You have a part, can this be made by additive manufacturing? Yes, that's a, I would call an impact factor one. And I would call, you know, it is a solution. You have a big crane of, uh, you know, you are paying a, a million dollar a day or whatever. And then you have last small ring uh, uh, in a bearing or somewhere. You want it, you know, otherwise you have to wait for three weeks. It, it provides solutions and bring your back your equipment or a thruster or, or crane, whatever. Third one is a service. India, if wanted to become like a software hub, you know, like, like now India is a superpower in software. You know, we could not compete in shipbuilding, but software. So why not uh, use the opportunities additive manufacturing provides the digital manufacturing capabilities. Use it and sell this competence. India has a full of human resources. So use it, it is not capital intensive. So a yeah, size of a truck, you know, uh, you have a machine, you have uh, uh, all sorts of, so, so, so as a part to part, as a solution, as a service, there are a lot of opportunities and this will really help Atmanir Bharat. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sastri. Excellent thought towards this. Um, having said that, Syed, do you think, um, as for guys who placed the order with our uh, shipyards here in uh, Cochin and Chaugle, actually met Dr. Sastri in Norway and then decided that, that maybe uh, the, the yards will be able to keep the time and quality Maybe. Do you think that is the reason why we got um, this order uh, to us, Sayed? Yeah, Mr. Sayed, you're on mute. If you could just unmute yourself. Thanks. Yeah. You know, actually, uh, Uchin Shipyard has got a good track record. This is the only shipyard in the Ministry of Shipping. The rest of them are private or the Ministry of Defense. And this is the only shipyard. And when people say why shipyards in India are failing or shipyards cannot be restructured, there are so many shipyards which have gone down. And I take the example of Cochin Shipyard, which has healthy profits and healthy cash flows. They have delivered the uh, first indigenous aircraft carrier. And uh, when I visited the yard, it was under process about a couple of years ago. Uh, that and also Chogle, which uh, initially this particular Chogle group, which was also running the Lavgan shipyard, these two companies have got a very good track record. They're very dedicated uh, and sort of professional uh, people whose focus is on standards and completing uh, deliveries on time. <laughs> of course, Cochin Shipyard, there's a lot of improvements to be done. So uh, definitely there is interest. Like there are shipyards in India which have gone down, had built about 169 vessels for foreign ship owners, which have gone newsprint carriers and various uh, very DP2 uh, anchor handlers and PSVs. So India has delivered very cost effectively and timely deliveries. At uh, one time, one shipyard uh, was delivering nearly about 15 to 20 vessels per year. 
So uh, not that uh, the uh, sort of skill or the uh, intent is not there, but somehow or the other, like I said, there are various factors which shipyards went down. So shipyards, uh, between all the private shipyards, private shipyards, they have done fantastic projects. Means very uh, even Bharti shipyard, I visited uh, most of the shipyards. Uh, they have done some really good vessels. Thank you, Sayed. Um, actually, I'll add on to say that these two shipyards, Cochin as well as Chogli, Cochin especially, despite the famous uh, labor uh, challenges that exist in the in the state of Kerala, as we all know, they are still uh, quite a bit successful. And their quality and cost of capital is quite good. They've been supported possibly very well. So having said that, Sujoy, do you think that will, in case you go for smaller vessels and not VLCCs as you normally do, but if you case, in case you go for smaller vessels or some of your uh, co-owners would want to um, build a smaller vessel, would you consider Cochin Shipyard having here heard about all these things? Sujay, you'll have to unmute, please. Good question. I think we uh, the simple answer would be we'll have to cross the bridge when we come to it. It's a very difficult uh, so say yes or no now. It's not a it's not what I, we see on the panel. We'll have to cross the bridge when as when we want to build an MR or a, whatever. If we go in that direction, we'll have to take it at that time. So maybe the, the first of the ones is uh, thanks to IAPS for placing the order with these yards and maybe Time will prove that this will help uh, in moving us forward. Uh, but Aditya, having heard from Dr. Shastri of the maritime part of it, uh, yes, as he said, he came into the maritime six years hence um, after things were this thing. But then that is the beauty of maritime sector. We wait for all the other sector to validate and prove it and then we absorb it and then take it forward tremendously. <laughs> we are um, So having said that, do you think this is a that could be a workable solution over and above just small component manufacturing in the maritime sector, given the hugeness of uh, parts. Aditya, you'll have to unmute, please. Yeah, sorry for that. So before I uh, respond to that, just you know, adding on to what uh, you know, Dr. Shastri said for point three, where you know this technology allows us to kind of advance our our technology so okay so far as, as you said we are a bit behind in shipbuilding but what am does or you know when we're looking at new product development or developing an engine for example you know it technology is it's it's a great leveler right so whatever you're making in in korea on a, on a 3d printer or additive manufacturing system or whatever you're making in, in the us you can make very well in india because the technology is the same uh, it's not going to take you uh, a long time to kind of build that skill so it's it's going to kind of help us leapfrog certain elements um, and of course be more competitive in these things because finally for a as, as it's a tool right whatever uh, you put into it the quality which you get out of it is going to be directly proportional so it, it's not a, a system where you can just put anything and it's going to magically help you but the thing is it is going to be a uh, enabler if we if we adopt it in the right place to right uh, ways but moving on to you know larger parts yes i think there is a lot of work going on these things if you look at new technologies like directed energy deposition or wam which is uh, you know large scale metal printing there have been you know bridges again these are direct references this is not specifically to maritime coming back but there have been bridges which have been built with this technology which have been installed in Amsterdam. Of course, these are more showcase pieces, but it shows the scale of the manufacturing uh, process. It shows, you know, these are where the design is certain design is provided and this bridge has been created and it's been installed in Amsterdam recently. Uh, so there are potential to kind of evolve this technology. And again, as you know, Dr. Shastri will, will uh, validate this, there are, the process needs to be kind of, uh, all the stakeholders need to come together and develop that process and get it approved. It is possible. Uh, it needs more, you know, confidence from from the stakeholders to kind of try it out. Maybe you know that is that is what uh, is needed. So if you look at look at uh, uh, the maritime space, you know, Williamson and Tyson Group have come together. They're creating something where they see a clear uh, business potential to use a additive manufacturing for the maritime industry. So there are, there already a start is being made in that direction. Uh, if you compare a like-to-like -like industry, if you look at oil and gas and offshore, because they are also uh, saddled by a lot of regulations, they are also a bit slow 
of the block for technology adoption, uh, uh, faster adoption. So if you look at Shell, who has uh, where they are looking at a distributed manufacturing structure for spares for their offshore, uh, you know, uh, systems, or if you they are looking, they recently uh, kind of approved a three D printed component uh, which can withstand a certain level of pressure. So it, this technology is making uh, uh, kind of strides very quickly uh, and very fast, but it's all proportional to how much the industry really uh, takes it up and kind of says, okay, let's do something in this and see how we can evolve around that. So there is definitely potential uh, with the technology available, but it depends on how you use the tool. Uh, that's that's what I would come uh, you know summarize on that. Very well said, Aditya. I'm sure Dr. Shastri has got a lot more to add to it. Uh, before I go to Sujai to ask him, because his experiences also needs to be, uh, you know, sort of inputted into this entire discussion for, for us to find an effective solution. So, Dr. Shastri. Yeah, thank you very much. I have not answered one of your uh, last part of your questions um, about the regulatory issues. Okay. So, Sujai also mentioned, okay, I would not put uh, some, you know, big, big um, propeller or what you know, maybe uh, I would uh, agree or disagree with that because as a owner, you leave it to the experts and class, uh, you know, whatever is, because casting, we have seen casting is there for more than 100, 200 or 500 years, have so many problems. When you when you trust the casting, why don't you trust the additive manufacturing? Because a lot of, um, lot of uh, you know, uh, surveyors told me, you know, when they go to, when they go to a casting place, you know, propeller casting or wherever a plant, when they weigh the the propeller blade, you know, it's you can see a ten percent hollow sometimes, you know, in a very bad manufacturer, you know. But but ideally, this can be accepted because you know there is no bulk test for that. There is no volumetric entity. You you do you ever do that once you, it breaks. But of course, we don't go, we don't deviate. What I want to say here. Now, um, we, let us take positively what Sujay has mentioned, that um, it is very important that all the stakeholders have to come and see that um, uh, this technology, is, if it grows on its own, it will be very difficult to shape it towards maritime needs. You know, so, so it is better to enter in early stage, look at another 10 to 20 years uh, um, horizon, and when a lot of maritime governments, IAX, IMO, all they are coming forward, they are paying attention. It needs more attention. Class, all the class societies now made so many rules and everybody is accepting additive manufactured components. But that, that does not mean that it is a plug and play. You just make anything and you put it. So, so a lot of research, actually, Yogyata wanted you know, a problem statement to the university's research centers. A lot, for example, I shared two very quick examples. Um, when I was talking to Semcorp Marine, Sem, uh, you know, they have so many shipyards in Singapore. Um, uh, so their R&D director came, and of course, Singapore government wanted to sponsor a very big project. And um, we did a more than a million dollar project. Uh, they found a, a case because they want to be bold. And so they were building a crane vessel, a billion dollar or more than a billion dollar crane vessel. They are importing uh, corner um, um, nodes, you know, uh, so they, they, they have more than 120 nodes. Uh, if, you, if you are importing from some other country, these are each one can be easily $10 million, four to $10 million, $120 million. Uh, the other time is six months to one and a half year. And they started, we, we did the project with them. We have published papers, you can see. It's not completed yet. We have come more than 70% now. You know, how can we make, um, you know, huge tons of, you know, several tons of um, um, additive manufactured notes. That's one of the most critical component. You know, it will, it will, uh, it, it's very important component for a ship, uh, for such a ship. But you have to try, and they would be successful at some point, and everybody will be behind them. You know, sell this technology to me. You know, the, so so why don't why don't the researchers focus on such technologies? We also started with some of the defense industry, uh, obviously for naval. Uh, 
Um, so where we they started several, two years ago a project with two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Very skeptical, but when the top management came to know, now they are talking about at least twenty five million dollar project. Um, you know, on how to expand it. So more the money, more the interest will come, more the problems will be solved. But who is investing? Uh, who is benefiting? All as uh, again in the beginning you said. It's about the governments, it's about the policy makers, and it's a long-term interest. So certainly um, there are regulations already, all the class societies are accepting, IMO, et cetera, don't bother about those uh, small components, whether it is made by casting or those things, but when there is a need, they will come back. And um, regulatory will be, will be thriving, you know, will accepting when all the stakeholders come and show interest. So that's what I want to stop here, yeah, thank you. Very well said, uh, Dr. Shasti. Thank you very much. Suja, I'm sure you would want to respond, especially the uh, component part of it. You'll have to unmute, Suja. I, I agree with Dr. Shastri. I mean, I am a very strong believer in digitalization. Our fleet is digital. And I believe in AM as a tool for the future. I don't disagree with it at all. Now, Unfortunately, the shipping industry globally is a very, very conservative industry. To take it forward with development on many, even digitalization, it took years for ships to become digital. COVID made it faster, that's all. Now, when you look at AM, we talked about IMO, black state. There's another component which is very important, especially with respect to the tanker industry. Okay. When you are going to use critical components made out of AM, and God forbid if there's incident and that leads to that component, which is made by AM, the entire rules for tankers using AM will change. So we need to be sure that if you're using a critical, I'm talking about critical components, I'm not talking about O-rings and, you are using a critical component, which is made out of AM. We need to be sure that it's quite strong and sturdy. Its lifetime on board is quite long. We need to be sure. And it's important that when you use AM on board, we do a risk assessment and we have OCIMF as a part of the whole game plan. At least that's what I would suggest is because they are an important stakeholder, especially in the tanker industry. Thanks, Sujai. Uh, Dr. Sastri, do you want to respond to this before I go to Syed? No, oh, but uh, thank you, because um, now we have a very good balance. We are not hyping things. We have, um, we have panelists um, that are, um, you know, trying to understand from their perspective and others are, you know, sharing that. So I think so the problem statement, the last two, two words um, Sujay has said, uh, these are problem statements again, you know, a lot of research has to be done. We have to be future ready, digital, whether we like or not, you know, for example, some years ago, we could change our car battery easily. Today, you open your bonnet, I, I bet you can't change um, your battery yourself. Why? So, so, so that, that's what digitalization is coming in a way, because if you plug your battery, you are, you are, you are disturbing the digital system. So a lot of digital digitalization is happening. So as part of that, we have to go and be ready in future to build uh, vessels or repair or the things. You need this technology. You need a foolproof manufacturing uh, technology. So all these problem statements we are bringing, yes, there is potential and there are problems to be solved. And it's in India has to uh, a lot to gain. It will never lose by adopting this technology. Definitely everything is a gain. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sastri. Uh, Sayed, having said this, from what I uh, personally envisage from this is that possibly cost of shipbuilding will reduce by partial usage of such technology. Maybe the financial stresses of shipyards may come down because of adopting such technology. What is your thought on this, Sayed? Sayed, please mute yourself.
Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kishore. Uh, there are direct costs and also there are uh, indirect costs. For example, we were uh, in one of the shipyards, we were making a set of uh, uh, pollution control vessels. And you know, typically what happens when you are making a series of vessels, I'm just taking a small case study, is uh, if you don't have the spares or if the spares are lost or damaged, you try to salvage it. And the last vessel which remains has a lot of things which has been sabotaged from there. Now, in these cases, again, uh, it's a typical case, very practical uh, case. Then you are running around for the spare parts, you're finding suddenly, and uh, like Dr. Shastri said, one small component can hold up the whole vessel. Doesn't have to be the main engine, it's just one impeller or just one uh, gearbox or just a gear which can uh, sort of hold up the whole delivery. So, in such cases, definitely uh, additive manufacturing for such components can. Uh, definitely add value here. And also like, uh, I'll just briefly go into the restructuring part of it. I've briefly gone into the pre-financial restructuring and operational turnaround of stress shipyards up to the final point of uh, voting by the committee of creditors and approval by NCLT for a new investor. Now at the stage when a new investor comes in amongst the financial planning he has to do, amongst the various other aspects he has to look at is the plan and execution of the cost to restart this yard. We have to understand that most of these shipyards, including the projects have been sort of lying there under the weather, facing all the severe weather for four, five or more years. So one of the things is all the equipments, obviously the shipyard does not have the money to do the preservation and maintenance of the infrastructure, for example, the cranes, and also the projects. One shipyard which I visited, just because the crane was damaged in a, in a storm, they could not put the gangway and go on board to do the preservation and maintenance. Now, when you go in to restart these projects, because that is one of the things, shipyards have about close to 40 projects which are partly built. So when you are doing the infrastructure on one side, the crane parts and various components and also the equipment spare parts on the vessels, when you open up, your aim can really add great value as uh, if we are really geared for that. So we have to get this perspective into shipyards. In fact, a lot of uh, digitization, just moving slightly away from additive manufacturing, uh, sort of data analysis, even commercial, you do data analysis. But as we all know, uh, that basically our industry is a very conservative industry. So uh, AM can add value in uh, basically vessels when you open up and suddenly a part is damaged or it is seized then you can do it by retail manufacturing. Thanks, Sayyad. Um, uh, Aditya, how uh, do you think our country is prepared to take this forward with shipyard? Because it's a very good thought. Possibly uh, some of us in the audience or some of us listening to us or reading, or seeing us on YouTube would get an idea of getting into this as a, a, a sort of a business into getting into a, a shipyard, maybe few machines there. And if the mission is as big as a truck, maybe have a mission put on board the vessel. Will it be able to take the vagaries of the seas? I don't know, but just a thought. What do you think, Aditya? I think if you look at uh, the local ecosystem uh, from the additive manufacturing point of view, definitely there are a few good companies now offering, uh, you know, producing these components for a few oil and gas and offshore and other companies outside India as well. So the skill factor is also uh, of manufacturing these components is also growing uh, in India. Uh, and of course, maritime, uh, there has been not so much adoption uh, as such, because perhaps it's because of, you know, our conventional uh, shipbuilding or uh, activities being a little behind uh, the whole ecosystem. But there are companies in the additive manufacturing space who already have good capability here. And I think if there is a progressive shipyard which wants to kind of explore this i think they could do with partnering with a you know a technology partner who can really enable them to explore this technology you know and and work out a few options and start with there at least have a study of studying for a component see how where it goes you know it's important that they at least explore it as i said so uh, and then as uh, dr shastri said you know project which starts with a few thousand of dollars can go into a million of dollars, you know, depending on how, how interesting they see this technology to be. Because finally, ships are mobile assets. And, you know, if we can save uh, and qualify spare parts in a proper way, these spare parts could be printed at the port of call 
and avoid all these customs uh, you know uh, regulations as well because if let's say it gets delayed in customs and the ship has to leave from that port to some some other place it's all uh, the, the paperwork and everything has to start again right this uh, could be possible for it to have uh, components made locally this makes it uh, quite interesting for uh, the companies as well operating in this space thank you aditya uh, taking on from i think one of you either you or dr shastri talked about distributed manufacturing um, which shell was considering possibly on the bottom side is distribution uh, manufacturing on the other side is distributed database going on to blockchain technology both sides uh, covering up so do you think uh, ship design itself will change in the future to have components being manufactured and connected together i remember some years back when yare viking was expanded in the japanese shipyard we had they had built an in between three tanks and then put it onto the ship and suddenly the vessel became some 450000 tonna um that was the first largest uh, carrier um, sujay you may remember that yare viking was the name of the vessel at that time it was called cy giant before that and when they did this in a japanese shipyard so you think distributed manufacturing could be an answer in the change in ship design okay maybe i can i can take this yes so maybe ship design would change or not depends on the equipment etc and its dynamics but uh, the business model definitely will change um, uh, with the you know it will uh, so distributed manufacturing is different from the digital warehousing of the parts okay so di- distributed manufacturing is to make parts where um, where you need whereas d- digital warehousing is to store in the cloud and and can be shared commonly so so that the whole you, you will get benefited from the whole world's competence and a lot of research has been going on now so dnv we are doing a joint industry research project with 20 companies now uh, that how this modalities that how everybody can in the world the whole ecosystem can be benefited we are writing rules for um, you know common rules for sharing that definitely it will change and uh, it will give more opportunity you know i, I remember one some guys repairing in singapore actually told me they have a good solution but the, and they they cannot sell it because this is an offline solution but a, a shipyard in brazil needs it now they can actually safeguard their solution in a in a registered way and people in in, in brazil can download it and pay the money to their their intellectual property that definitely will um, and just one more point uh, not to exceeding so i have heard from many ship owners and uh, governments that they want to see at least 10 to 20% of spare parts already before you are ordering the ship comes as a condition that it uh, to the oems like uh, what cellar we have you know the the engine makers that you should make it available 10% of the spare parts for us through additive manufacturing or a digital technology you cannot say that you know it it will take several months and this trend is it will be a future trend i believe yes thank you thank you captain kishun thank thank you dr shastri going up to sujoy sujoy you have got a lot of orders in the far east uh, yards um, as we speak now do you think they have started adopting this technology dr shastri has already talked about the major engine manufacturers uh, being pressurized by the owners saying that hey you need to have at least this much to be uh considered towards am what is your uh, experience sujay uh, i can't say for the last one year or rather 15 months or so if they've st- developed started developing am for components for the new builds in korea but at least till i was there when the last ship was out we never had any am manufactured component on our fleet no but of course with technology the r&d departments of the three major shipyards in korea Samsung Hyundai and DSME I'm sure they will develop it over a period of time oh yes yes i mean given the fact that singapore is already looking forward to that and given the fact that sayed is was talking about smaller components that could easily be done in the uh, in the west asian shipyards um, maybe sayed you can throw some light on this um, any experiences recent Uh, frankly uh, i have not had a uh, very recent experience on this because i'm still working with the uh, shipyards which are still under the nclt process so uh, uh, but what dr shastri said it does make uh, uh, because some of the uh, like i'll take a typical case one of the shipyards under financial stress 
they could not uh, commission the ship lift because of just a few components. And now that company which was making that ship lift has gone out of business. So where do you get the spare parts from? Of course, some few companies have come up which they say they can support. And uh, at the time we were considering these companies What's a very typical case with the whole ship lift, which is a big item for the shipyard as one of the major infrastructure for uh, getting the ships in. And there were just a few components in the winch, some mechanical parts. So that is where, uh, so the limit, as we get into it, it keeps on expanding. You can go more and more and more into the additive manufacturing into these parts. <laughs> so Aditya, if we have old design, even obsolete parts can be easily manufactured as long as you have availability to the design. Am I right in stating this? So having said that, Dr. Shastri, how do you think regulation-wise this will be accepted by the class as a solution as we go forward? This is very, very, very interesting. I have been one of the toughest approval guys, uh, you know, when I was uh, working in the manufacturing people, you know, come that I have, a, you know, small, small part and, you know, if it is not coming from a manufacturer uh, uh, approved or so many, we are very, very careful about the quality issues and, you know, even the procedural issues. So from that, when I went to Keppel Shipyard in five years ago, and uh, some of the old guy was talking to me saying that a senior said, you know, a person, hey, when welding is known for a long time and we have problems still with welding and now you're talking about additive manufacturing, I can't, uh, I can't imagine that a class society talks about this. Uh, so I told, told him, now I'm not talking like a class society, we are promoting the technology and we are coming forward, you know, we are customer, you know, centric. Now we are saying that if you have a you know, need, because Keppel actually contacted us five years ago. So if you want to adapt, we are ready to come forward. Our, our um, DNV is a progressive technology friendly uh, company. It doesn't mean that it accepts any substandard, but it will help to stand the technology to mature. So now coming to, the, uh, to, to your question, so what I would say is, yes, um, why we are doing that, we believe a lot of problems that lie in traditional manufacturing, like casting, forgings, and many other, uh, many 80% of the big quality cases we have seen. For example, one big ship, I still remember, lost a rudder, you know, and it's how horrible it is. It, it, it leads to a very small mistake done by a human somewhere. Class or nobody can actually you know, intervene this because it could be during the, during the transport, during you know, uploading somewhere. Uh, for example, I, maybe for, for easy understanding, I tell one of the big, one, one of the chain makers, for example, you know, this is for uh, offshore oil and gas, but it, it has no big difference. So this is small um, dent on a, or a small, blur, uh, you know, something on a, on a chain link. Uh, inexperienced or maybe experienced supervisor actually asked somebody to grind it. It was uh, grounded too much and uh, you know, nobody picked it up. You know, this was after class gave the certificate and it went and this platform, um, you know, uh, platform lost one chain and stability, several billions of dollars lost. So, so what I want to say is now a lot of technological, you know, uh, failures are coming are also rooted to human errors because a lot of human intensive manufacturing. Now additive manufacturing automate a lot of manufacturing uh, automation. And uh, as, as, as Aditya said, you know, doesn't make, make any big difference whether you make it in advanced country or a, an undeveloped country wherever whether you print it in Nigeria or print it in Korea, the machine should be able to give a good part. And in that sense, you, you, you get rid of a lot of human error problems. You know, that is what we, we think, you know, uh, help the industry as if, if a, a right research, if right approach and right rules are taken care, you know, by everybody who is the stakeholder. So that's what we are progressive and we are interested. And we also see digital manufacturing is coming in a big way and it will definitely help. 
so so in in both fronts we we are trying to help this and definitely we see that um, one more thing maybe um, i'll share i visited some of the old uh, propeller maker uh, casting companies that you know for example singapore is only left with one one of the propeller uh, casting companies for example is same in germany and several other places lot of they if you ask them they have a problem of 50 plus years staff only there working no young generation wanted to work there because of lot of smoke you know same with the lot of foundries now additive one day you would see um, additive manufactured products coming from uh, clean factories maybe still expensive but the castings will be more expensive because no nobody wants to take that dust and all those and also casting is is a lot of um, you know you need lot of intellectual people you know at least some of the technicians need to be very intellectual but uh, in additive manufacturing you can you can manage with you know these days in the initially you need experts but over the time you need anybody who knows how to push a button can can actually produce parts so so that's that's my yeah point on that thank that's you that's a that's an excellent statement dr shastri very true going forward i think this is uh, going to create a revolution in this industry uh, and would be a very big um, support on the flip side especially for sayed and sujay uh, you know especially on difficult vessels we are used to using refurbished parts coming out of alan maybe that industry will suffer a hell of a lot in uh, <laughs> maybe i do not know going forward so just a thought any thoughts on this side uh, especially the industry of reverse engineering may go down i know there are uh, people in uh, ue and all who got huge inventories so they take the part and uh, do reverse engineering in gujarat so uh, i know this callous and it is very irresponsible because they say okay worst come to worst if there's a failure i'll replace the part so which is but what about the other damages which are the consequential damages which are and these industries need to be tackled and there are so many unscrupulous people who are doing this reverse engineering so rather to have uh, advanced manufacturing than doing this sort of unscrupulous reverse engineering and maybe that is cheaper the advanced manufacturing you think uh, this technology may be much much cheaper and lack of skilled manpower as very uh, no no need of skilled manpower as dr shastri said is another aspect of it a uh, gentleman having said that i think this is a very new um, subject as far as the marine industry is concerned and the uh, as far as the world is concerned i mean why marine industry but more so uh, the need of the hour for marine industry to adopt this so i would request yogyata to possibly open out for questions from the audience because many of the audience may have questions especially um, on this technology so yogyata up to you yeah certainly so what i'll do is i'll let everyone unmute themselves because right now you can't but just before that there's an interesting comment in the chat box which i'll just read out and probably someone may have some inputs on that uh, so it says that we need to change design of ship from single unit to modular units as much as possible to align uh, with additive manufacturing and parallel 3d manufacturing sites needs to be uh, made bigger like for example 3d manufactured homes and same for ships so these two ends can meet conveniently so i think this also puts up a question what are the maximum uh, sizes that uh, 3d uh, added additive manufacturing allows so if anybody would like to answer uh, see one part if i may uh, take on yeah. that question one of uh, is about uh, modular ship building so ideally in ship building it is uh, a modular ship building so ideally unlike i would like to name the shipyards in india and all where they make vessels so you make empty hull then you cut the deck to put in the engine so the ship is at the design stage basically it is made into modular and these when we say modular the uh, parts which are basically see when you start off a ship basically you are starting with steel plates and profiles which becomes panels then the panels become into sub blocks which become into blocks and then mega blocks so ideally all these uh, blocks at the construction stage should be outfitted the important thing is to outfit it with all the foundations of the machinery put in the machinery put in the pipes put in the cable trays put in the uh, uh, all the and do the outfit as much as possible rather than building the whole uh, shell and then cutting into it uh, 
I don't know. I've, I've recently, I came to know that even Sembawang and some of the shipyards in Singapore are looking at additive manufacturing by making blocks also. Uh, I'm not, it's just very recently I uh, got into it. But coming to modular shipbuilding, the shipbuilding ideally should be modular. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shastri, anything to add? Yeah, maybe um, I, I repeat one thing, uh, which I actually you know tell to our surveys when we train train them in material courses. There is a difference between fabrication and manufacturing. Fabrication is bringing parts of any size and joining them without losing much of the property, but a very limited like welding or bolting is done. This is called fabrication. Manufacturing is making a material and inbuilt the properties required. Okay, so that's what you can't do manufacturing at the shipyard. What you do at the shipyard is always a fabrication. Manufacturing is always done in a in a manufacturing place. You know that's what you don't produce engines at at, at the shipyard, or or um, you know any parts of it. Now, additive manufacturing size is not you know you are not going to replace steel plates or steel pipes with additive manufacturing. So size. You, I don't think any really matters. Steel plates, steel mills will continue, pipe mills will continue. But additive manufacturing will help where more complex it is, complex parts come into place, um, where you, you, you add a lot of features to a part or a lot of materials, um, properties required in different places like multi-materials, et cetera, where. So, so additive manufacturing can make um, you know several meters of it, but it doesn't matter uh, because for the applications, as I said about the node and all those things, you will still use fabrication. You will still use welding to to join additive manufactured parts. So so, but of course, I if I comment on this design of the ship, uh, there were also comment about propulsion system. Yes, so it could be easy to to now could be replaced gears, it could be replaced some of the parts, even the engine crew. If you give the more power to the engine crew or whatever uh, the onboard crew to repair more of the sophisticated equipment because they are made very simple. So that's what additive manufacturing can, can help. So you don't need always engineers from the, the OEM companies coming. Yeah, that's... Uh, Right, that's great. So I have received actually two more questions and uh, all of you can also unmute yourselves and ask once we are done with this. So the first one is, um, are we ready to take autonomous manufacturing order now? And um, shipbuilding industry is capital incentive uh, intensive. Do you think that Indian yards need more financial assistance over and above the present one that they have? Sayed, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, actually, uh... Uh, during quite a, a few years ago, I was part of the Shipyard Association of India and dealing with the uh, Ministry of Shipping. Of course, they have to integrate with the Ministry of Finance and all the uh, on uh, uh, various subsidies. So I would say, uh, uh, I would really say that the political will is there. And why I would say, yes, it is there because I have seen, I was part of this subsidy program which the government uh, started and they were giving subsidies and various uh, sort of SOPs which were given to the industry. Now it is up to the industry players to take it in the right spirit and word to really make it uh, uh, sort of happen. So like I said, from the government side, there is of course the cost of uh, like here, that's why we used to when you have the repeat term loan, which we call uh, RTL and also you have the uh, people take one of the reasons a small shipyard on the uh, east coast went down because initially they were supposed to get this uh, sort of foreign exchange to do it where the interest rate was about 3% or 3.5% and then they had to take a rupee term loan where they had to give 10, 11, 12%. So the cost of borrowing in India is high but there are other factors also like I said one is this fiscal discipline that is really good because if you look at all the shipyards we have Indian people as CEOs, as at all levels, as managers of all the departments, whether it is all the four major shipyards in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Batam, uh, there are so many people in all the sectors. So the skill is here and it is just up to the uh, sort of key players from the top management, the promoters to really go the right way and lead it like Cochin Shipyard and Chogle Shipyard. Well said, Sayyid. 
So, Jay, you want to add anything more to it? Yeah, I could add a bit. You know, when I'm, when you order a ship in new building, the shipyard has to give a refund guarantee. Now, in China, a lot of the major shipyards are government players. So, the government provides a sovereign refund guarantee. And that removes a lot of burden on the shipyard. Now, in Korea, the shipyard, uh, shipbuilding industry in general and the shipyard financing has matured over the last 30, 40 years, if not more. And they've involved mechanisms where the interest rates are lower for financing. However, in India, the financial institutions, to the best of my understanding, is they do not focus on the shipbuilding industry per se, and the cost of bank guarantees are much higher. So that is a burden on the shipyards in general. Now, in the case of the government shipyards, you've got the government guarantee. But in the private sector, this will come into play. That's my input for this part, at least. Thanks, Sujay. Uh, Yogita, anybody else with questions? You can possibly open yeah. the floor. Yeah, so uh, uh, everyone, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, we do have one or two more in the chat box, so maybe I can just... Right, so, okay. Um, one question, actually, uh, this is, I've received directly and also on the public chat from two different people. They are asking about ABG Shipyard. So if there are any comments on those uh, current present issues and what happened with ABG Shipyard, technically speaking, if there is any hmm. comment on that. <laughs> Interesting question. In fact, I was answering that question. Uh, uh, but basically, was it technical or something else, Sayyad? Is the first question. <laughs> uh, because there are various reports, as you have seen in the media, there's an EY forensic report, and there are various reports from the print and all these various media things. Uh, but like I said, this question I would not like to answer because currently it is under uh, a regulatory process. So I would not like to uh, discuss this subject. Yes, we, actually it is uh, sub judice, so we cannot, uh, uh, both Bharati and ABJ as well as Great Offshore, better to leave it out of the yeah. question. Sorry. And, uh, Shipyard, all these shipyards Power. probably are under various stages of NCLT and now gone to CDI and also I would like to discuss that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, also, one more, what materials are possible in additive manufacturing? Because mainly it was always associated with the uh, carbon, uh, you know, uh, uh, so what kind of materials are uh, possible and which ones are not through additive manufacturing? Uh, I think materials, uh, you know, just to give it summary, there are, the list is quite long. So it's yeah. not uh, one or two materials. So if you look at it, you know, there are groups, look like polymer, you look at ceramics, you look at metal. Uh, under metal, today you have aluminum, you have steels, you have different alloys uh, depending on the need. There are custom-made alloys as well. So there are people developing alloys for specific applications. Uh, copper is one metal which is used. So there is, uh, and generally as, as uh, you know, adding to what uh, Dr. Shastri said, manufacturing is, you know, developing a certain process for it. So there is, you know, companies now especially de designing alloys as well. So it's, it's definitely... Uh, a large range of materials are possible to with that additive manufacturing. And even concrete, you know, you've seen now people looking at building construction uh, components with it. So it is a large group of technologies and the, the list of materials available is quite a, uh, quite a large list. Right. Right. Uh, right. Uh, if there are more questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask our panel. We still have some minutes and we can take, I think, a couple. I think Captain Philip Matthews, uh, do you have a question? I can see his hand. Yeah, I'm not sure who's he signaling. <laughs> right. Uh, but if there are no questions, Captain Kishore, uh, you can always see if uh, we need to call for the assimilation or something. And we can always ask people to email us later on on any input, feedback, or questions that they may have. Yeah, thank I'll you, Yogita. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely correct. And this being a subject which is... Uh, uh, think of tomorrow, there will be a lot of questions which could come up. I personally had an um, you know interaction with the guys who built the two bedroom hall which must have which has come in the papers in uh, IIT Chennai. Um, IIT Chennai Research Lab has done that research park as it is called. It's being headed by the former dean of uh, IIT Mandi, 
um, you know, Mr. Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez, he's the one who's heading that. There is a lot of uh, moment in, in, in these areas that is coming up. Uh, but in that sector, acceptance of uh, free fab structures, free fab structures in construction uh, sector is a question mark. But with, when it comes to maritime, I think our acceptance is going to be much faster. We could literally see the advantage of having such a technology helping us not to build ships, but to run ships, but to for, for shipyards. Uh, small, um, uh, uh, you know, repairs and uh, operational difficulties, and to do away with the supply chain problem that happens across the world, or the custom clearances problems that happens across the world. So maybe yes, it is more closer to us than what we think, and there could be a lot of uh, movement in this direction. With this, I would like to thank all the panelists. I think it was an excellent discussion going on forward, and leave it to Ulas uh, to assimilate and uh, sum up the session. We'll ask to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, good evening, good afternoon to all of all the panel members. And uh, I'll just uh, start off a little bit uh, uh, the background. Two years ago, Dr. Sastri introduced this subject. As far as I'm concerned, I think I learned a little bit from him two years ago. And after two years, I think probably I might have added one or two percent to my knowledge on AM. And uh, after listening to uh, the, all the panelists, I think it has further boosted my confidence in uh, assimilating very interesting uh, uh, seminar. And uh, uh, I think this, <clears throat> the, uh, there is no end to its application. And I would, to summarize, I would say it's not a panacea for shipbuilding. Definitely, it's not a panacea. I think there has to be a, a, a measured approach as to which components can be manufactured and which cannot be. I mean, it cannot be a far-fetching that straight away I'll manufacture a propeller of a VLCC or even one meter diameter or two meter diameter. Impellers, yes. I think sometime ago I read an article. I think how one of the, uh, the AM... Uh, supplier or provider, he did install a printer on a ship to manufacture small components so that the waiting period for spare parts and other related aspects. Such as, sorry, uh, the custom clearance and waiting period could be uh, solved without much of a hindrance, of course. The skill set is a must for a ship's crew or as to how that printer could be used and a small components could be manufactured, such as pump impeller. This is just one example. The, just to summarize, I think all of them said, what are the problems, where it could be employed and uh, how it can be uh, enhanced and the application can be used or uh, to advantage the ship owner or ship repair or ship repairer. Uh, the bigger components, I think it's a still a far cry. Maybe five years, 10 years down the line when the technology is matured enough so that the, everybody can adopt it and use it, however simple it may sound today. But yes, the regulatory issues which uh, some of you, some of the panel members did raise, being a... Uh, the classification society employee, a former, I can say yes. The the approval is a big issue. I mean, it cannot be just overnight. You cannot give an approval to a propeller as as per the conventional way of inspection and approval. <clears throat> this is where the regulatory issues will come because here the the flag also will step in because their involvement also uh, matters in such. Uh, wherever the safety issues are involved. Now, the, the bigger components where the approval is required, perhaps as one of the panel members said, the OEM, the owner has asked the OEM to manufacture or to supply 5% or 10% of the spare parts uh, as uh, essential spare parts for on a ship. Could I think there the validation could be done and the further confidence could be gained, yes. AM is there to stay and AM is going to 
uh, resolve or solve some of the problems which industry is facing. These are the uh, point which I would like to summarize without taking much time. I think a lot more needs to be done. And uh, thank you all the panel members, each and every one. You gave your insight, input, and uh, a very uh, thought-provoking uh, talk on this particular very interesting topic. Application is vast, perhaps. I think some of the universities can introduce this subject in the third year or final year for so that the interest can be evoked among the students and they can further, maybe under the guide of Dr. Shastri, they can do the master's or PhD under the him. Thank you very much once again. Yeah. Absolutely Thank correct, uh, Ulas. I mean, actually, there is a clear uh, chance of doing research in this subject. Maybe take a case study and see how a shipyard can benefit or a workshop can benefit, uh, both in recurring cost as well as in other costs. Absolutely correct. Thank you, Yogita. Right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, esteemed panelists, uh, moderator, SM data for doing this session. I just want to say that uh, this, uh, as Mr. Kalgadgi very, uh, said that two years back, he heard about additive manufacturing. It was actually at IMRC 2020, where some of us were there. And uh, you must have, if some of you have attended the inauguration, uh, we did share that all of these problem statements are drawn from outcomes of 2020. And we also studied the Maritime India Vision uh, document by GOI very much in detail. And this is one of the sessions which is an actual uh, uh, very good alloy of both because uh, it does talk about, the document does talk about uh, strengthening shipbuilding, dry docking repairs industry in India. And because we already had discussed additive manufacturing, we wanted to draw that into this discussion and see if it's a potential solution uh, and if uh, also Indian manufacturers and setups can take advantage of it. And I would also like to say that gathering all these inputs, IMRC team is now going to work on publishing a paper. Uh, we will also uh, gather inputs from the moderator assimilator head. Uh, we have also done a rudimentary literature review, which you can find on our website. If you visit for this particular section, we have collected some material and literature, which you can uh, review and which we will also use. And I'm also hoping as part of the paper, we can uh, see what are the potential research areas in this uh, topic. And also if there are some alternate technologies, which could be used to close gaps uh, uh, in shipbuilding, additive manufacturing, etc. And it could all come together uh, as a more holistic. And that also could be taken forward over those new technologies and discussed in future, uh, uh, you know, in correlation to this. So this is all I have to say in closing. I would like to thank everyone for attending this session and for some great questions. Uh, there is one last question which we could not tackle. It's It was that, is it possible to reach our 2030 vision towards shipbuilding? And I have to say, it's a pretty big question and we will try to answer it through the paper and the work that we are just going to start doing uh, right after IMRC uh, 2022 this week. So uh, with that, thank you everyone so much for attending. And uh, uh, tomorrow morning, we are going to have a session on uh, environment GHG emissions and those targets which have to be achieved by 2030 and 2050. And we have a great panel for that as well. Uh, uh, and so please join us tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock Indian Standard Time. It will be at the same Zoom link and the same website that you all visited today. So thank you again so much. And thanks to all the panelists and our um, subcommittee for doing thank this. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.